Hey there, and welcome to the Home Church YouTube channel. My name's Kenny, and I'm the lead pastor right here at Home Church based out of Denver, North Carolina. We're excited that you chose to join us for today's message, and I believe that God is gonna use today's word to challenge and encourage you in your walk with Jesus. But listen, wherever you're watching from all across this world, we invite you to join us by subscribing to this channel so that you get the freshest content that we produce every single week. But also, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, we'd invite you to do that as well. Visit our website at myhomechurch.cc backslash give to partner with us. We pray that God uses this message to challenge you today and to bless you as you hear the teaching of God's word. Well, hey, good morning and welcome to Home Church. My name's Kenny and it's my honor to be the lead pastor here. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you felt rejected in your life. Um, I remember when I was uh, in, in 10th grade, uh, I've told this story a, a little bit before, but I was involved in marching band. Any other marching band geeks with me? Yeah, yeah, that's my people. That's my people. Um, and so I was in marching band, but I had, uh, I had aspirations to be even band geekier. Uh, and so I actually wanted to be the drum major, all right? So I, I played uh, tuba and baritone, but I wanted to be the drum major. And so I remember uh, practicing and kind of doing all that I needed to do to get ready. And I went and I auditioned and uh, I had this friend uh, and her name was Jessica. And she, were, she and I were friends. And actually, I'll be very honest with you, I had a crush on her. And, uh, and she too wanted to be a drum major. And so we would practice together. And, uh, you know, it, I thought we were both building relationship and that I was going to be a drum major. And it was all that stuff. So I finally go and go to the audition and, and she goes and we're talking afterwards and I'm like, how'd it go? Good. And then, you know, we start building all these plans about what would it be like to both be drum majors together and we're going to fall in love and get married. Now, you know, we just start walking down that, that whole path. And, uh, and then, um, so what they would do is they would put a little list outside the band room. It said drum majors and, and there's the names. And uh, Jessica's name was at the top and my name was nowhere on the list. And that hurt. Um, it was something I really, it was something I really wanted. And what's interesting is I, as I look back, I, I, I actually then turned and I blamed Jessica for what had happened. Um, I don't know, there's something in my weird subconscious that like I was blaming her, like this was her fault. When in reality, she had nothing to do with the decision. She wanted the same thing I did. And, and, and so then I, I noticed, again, looking back, like I noticed I started to treat her differently. I started to feel differently towards her. Uh, there was then kind of this weird, like, r r like I don't know, um, just rivalry and animosity that was, that was there. And, and interestingly, you know, so I, I, I felt rejected, but then I started to put my blame <laughs> where it didn't belong. Um, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you can relate to at least some of it in the way of uh, having felt rejected. Um, it, it's an interesting thing how we, how we deal with these things. I, I think... If you're being honest, all of us in some way, shape, or form have felt rejected in our life. Uh, for some of you, maybe it was a job that you really wanted that you got turned down for. Um, maybe it was a friendship or relationship that you desired that just kind of didn't, didn't work out. Um, there, there are other situations where maybe there was a person that you loved and you wanted to be with and, and they just didn't see it. They just put you in the friend zone and said, man, you're like my best friend. I could never date you. Or may, maybe you did go along that path and you actually got married and then along the way your spouse rejected you. Um, maybe there's a situation kind of like me. I mean, you can see uh, uh, not getting a drum major thing, but, but maybe you wanted to be on a sports team um, and you were not invited to be on that team. And, or just in general, I, I know that there are people who walk this earth, they just feel neglected. They feel rejected. They feel like they've not been included. They feel like they don't have a, a group or a clique or a, a family to kind of be a part of. And so I think many of us can, can truly understand in some way, shape, or form what it feels like to be rejected. The, the difficulty is that because most of us know what that feels like between people, unfortunately, especially in a room this size, there is a 100% possibility that there is at least one person in the room who not only has felt that way from other people, but that you carry the heavy burden of actually feeling rejected by God. It's a difficult thing. Um, there, there are things that you've experienced in your life. Maybe it was the, the loss of a, of a loved one. 
Someone passed away. Maybe you've been hurt by a church. Like uh, you, you saw God's representatives and they did wrong things or said things that hurt you or treated you poorly and, and you've been hurt by the church and you started to blame God for that. Maybe you feel like you're just alone and you've been crying out to God, I, I need a, a partner, I need a friend, I, I'm lonely, God, can you help me here? And you have gotten nothing. Maybe you felt neglected by God. Maybe you continued to ask him for things and it never showed up. Maybe you just haven't sensed his presence in your life and you just like, Maybe he didn't want anything to do with me. See, all of us have felt rejection, but there's an extra heavy burden of feeling like your God rejected you. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We've been walking through a series called House of Hope. One of the things that I felt like God told me over the summer was that there are so many people that are dealing with a lack of hope in so many places of their life, but that this is meant to be a house where we can continue to show and preach and show where hope is available for anyone, no matter what you're walking through. And so we've been walking through what's called the faith chapter. This is Hebrews chapter 11, and we've been going through it verse by verse. And by the way, we will. We're going to continue in this series uh, all the way up to Christmas, and there's so much uh, incredible things still yet here to see. And so we're going to continue in this series today, and uh, we're going to talk about a story and a piece of this that... um, Maybe it won't make sense at first, but I want to bring it all together. So if you have your Bible, um, join me uh, really quickly. We're going to be in two places. You can go to Hebrews chapter 11, and as you find that, that's kind of towards the back of your Bible. Um, And then you can slide all the way back to the front of your Bible in Genesis chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to throw the scripture on the screens. If you're watching online, we'll throw it at my feet. Uh, if you're in the room and maybe you have the Version Bible app, we have a, a live event happening right now where you can follow right along. Uh, Home Church also has a, an app that you can follow along with the sermon notes. And so uh, we're going to continue in this series, House of Hope. Uh, Pastor Josue did a great job last week of giving us hope for those who are skeptical. And so today I want to talk to you about hope for the rejected. Hope for the rejected. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 4, here's what it says. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offering, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. And I know you might be like, Pastor, what? I read that, but I didn't hear anything about rejection in there, so help help me understand. Well, um, I'm glad you asked. I want to show you there's a backstory to understanding this Abel that we're hearing about goes all the way back to the first family. Again, I'll invite you to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. We have Adam and Eve, and they were in the garden, and then they sinned, uh, and then God sent them outside of the garden, and then they started to create and have a family, and this is where we find this story, all right? So, Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. I want you to say Cain, all right? Because we're going to talk about two brothers. you got to get them straight here, right? She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Say Abel. All right? Now say Cain and Abel. Thank you. Uh, Now Abel kept his flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought some excuse me, brought also an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. At first reading of this story, the truth is, is that I think many of us can probably relate to Cain. We, we have these two brothers, and they both bring an offering to God, and yet the Bible says that, that God found and, get, and showed favor over Abel's offering and not over Cain's offering. Now, uh, I have a, a brother, and his name is Kevin, um, and so one of the things that I tell people all the time is that Kevin is my mom's favorite, and it's, it's just true. You can ask my mom, and she'll straight up tell you, like, yeah, yeah. He's, and I don't know why, because I was a good kid. I thought I was a good offering, and yet my mom shows favor to my brother. I don't, I don't get it. And so in this way, like at first reading, I read this, and I'm, a, a, I'm like Cain. Like, no wonder he's angry. Like, he brought an offering to God as well. 
And, and, and God chose to show favor to Abel rather than Cain. And when you read that, I, I, it's, yeah. I, I mean, I get it. I, I understand that Abel brought the fat portions of his calf and his first fruits and, and all that kind of stuff. I get all that, but, but he, Cain still brought an offering to God. And yet, God saw favor over Abel's rather than Cain's. Again, many, many of you have felt this way. Many of you have experienced this feeling of rejection. You, you felt like you brought your best. You felt, felt like you had all of these things that you were ready to engage with, and you maybe to the relationship or to the job, and, and it just didn't work out. A boss didn't show favor to you. Someone chose someone else over you. Like Many of us have experienced these things. But for Cain to feel rejected by God, that's a whole nother level. It's a whole nother level, right? I think many of you have probably experienced this. You were expecting, and you, you came to God, and you were expecting a healing, and he gave it to someone else. You were expecting the, the big job and the big promotion, and somebody else got it. You were expecting that big project to pay off, and all of a sudden, you were going to get your due. Somebody else came up with the idea first. I think many of us have had these moments of rejection where we felt like we were treated unfairly. You felt rejected, and I just want to acknowledge it's understandable. It's understandable. But the thing is, is that as we look at this story, there's more than meets the eye here. But I think it's important that we look at how God then deals with this moment. Because I'm a dad, and uh, I try not to show favoritism to my children, but inevitably there's times where it happens. And I can almost imagine having this scenario work out where my kids all brought uh, a finger painting, and I put one on the refrigerator, and I put the other in the trash. That's a great Bluey episode, by the way, if you've missed that one. Check it out. It's a good one. Um, preaching bluey. and I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but I can imagine how one of my children would feel if they felt rejected by me. So, I, so of course, I'm not God, but I put myself in the, in the role of that father figure, and I start to think about that. And I want you to see how God responds to Cain in this rejection. Verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Wait, what do you mean, why am I angry, right? He goes, why is your face downcast? Are those not interesting questions for God who just chose one gift over another to say? There has to be more to this, right? Why, why would he respond in that way? Wouldn't he understand why Cain would be upset? Verse 7, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. See, there's a critical thing that you and I need to understand about God. God's ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher and different than our thoughts. You see, our God's perspective on you and I and this world are different than what we have. The, the problem is, is that he sees things very differently than oftentimes we do. Because the reason he responds to Cain in this way is because Cain missed something. Cain missed something that already existed, and today I came to give you some hope. Because I think many times we've missed it as well. Cain's angry because God showed favor but God comes to him and he's like, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? And at first reading, you and I would probably side with Cain. We'd be like, yeah, I'd probably be upset too. But then God has this interesting turn of phrase that he used. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? The thing that Cain missed and many of us miss is this, is that when we feel rejection, and oftentimes when we feel rejection by God, the thing that you've missed is that he told you no right now, and so we think that he did not accept us. But the problem is, and the truth is, is that God already accepted you before the moment that you felt rejected. I need you to hear this. This is important. When you feel rejected, you feel not accepted. 
But what God was saying to Cain, and what I came to encourage you with today, is this. He may have told you no to the healing. He may have told you no to the things that you've been desiring. And it's not because God hates you, and it's not because God has forgotten you. It's because you missed the gift that you already had, that God has already accepted you. He just said no to this. He did not say no to you. He said no to this. By God saying this to you and I, here's what he's saying. He's not saying that you're rejected. Don't come around me. I don't love you. I'm not showing favor to you. He's trying to tell you, not right now, because I have better for you. And I know what some of you would say. You would say, but pastor, like the loved one that I had died. What do you mean? How is waiting? How is better? And this is the crux of our problem is because we are a self-centered, personal, all we care about is ourself. We're selfish. Can we just be real? Because here's what happens. Yes, you may have lost someone, but here's what truly happened. It was not better for you, but guess who it was better for? Because they don't suffer anymore, and they now stand in the presence of God. See, we're we're only upset and we're only angry at God over things like that because we don't see the whole picture. We only look at our own self. We only look at how it affects us and what we wanted to get out of it, not what God wanted out of it and how it maybe benefits and serves and works in his plan for other people as well. God saying no right now is his loving way of saying, son, daughter, I've got better for you. Will you be patient and trust me? That's what he's trying to say to you. So there's two things I need you to hear in this. Number one is, you were already accepted. You were not rejected. Number two is that God saying no to you is not rejection. It's him saying, I got better for you. Will you wait? Will you trust me? So I want you to meditate on that for a moment. I want you to think about that in your life. How many times have you been told no? Because in this moment, I I thought I was going to be a drum major. I thought Jessica Parker and I were going to go on and get married. And I, I was told no to both of those things. And yet, here I stand today, and here's what here's what happened in that situation. Because of that rejection, I actually decided to go and join the chorus as well. Fell in love with it so much that I actually went to school to be a chorus teacher. And then along the way, didn't even use that, worked at the YMCA, found my wife Katie. We've been married 13 years. Amen? Let's go. Man, I may have missed out in that moment because God had better for me. Here's the other thing about rejection. Sometimes when God tells us no or something doesn't work out, uh, we, we miss that he's got better for us. We also miss that many times he's protecting us from things that we cannot see. Many times he's protecting you from yourself. We miss these things. The other part that we miss is in the greater picture, we misunderstand who God is and what that means for our life. See, his priorities are are different than our priorities because in our world, the first is first, right? And if you're not first, you're what? You're last. Oh, Ricky Bobby, the gospel of Ricky Bobby, okay? (laughs) But the Bible teaches a completely different perspective that God has for how things work out for people. The Bible says that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The Bible teaches that those who serve will lead, and those who lead will ultimately then serve. The Bible teaches that to have life, you must give up the life that you have. See, you and I, we're so busy getting caught up in all the things that we want that we don't look at the world in God's eyes. We don't understand the situations from his perspective. And then we respond from the rejection that wasn't even rejection, and we make our lives more difficult because we don't see it his way. How do I know? (laughs) Oh boy, watch how Cain responds. He missed it. Verse 8, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. Now, 
My brother and I have had this conversation before. (laughs) It ended a little differently, thank goodness. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Wait, what? Wait, what? Cain felt rejected by God, so he took it out on his brother? Well, that sounds kind of crazy, but the reality is is that if you think about a lot of the times you've been rejected, you and I have done the same thing. We don't take our rejection out in the place that it's truly meant to be. We take it out on people. You get fired from your job, you come home, you yell at your wife and kids. You, uh, you, you get turned down by the person you wanted to love. You come down and you come back and you shut it off with your parents. You don't want to talk to them. Like, why do we do this? Why do we respond in this way? Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, listen, this is right after he kills his brother. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? So again, not only did he respond with violence because of his feeling of rejected, now he's starting to degrade. He knows that God knows all things and he's lying to his face. Why do we do that? Verse 10, the Lord said, and I can almost just hear it in this fatherly voice, knowing when your kids have already messed up and you come to them and say, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Verse 11, now you were under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be relentless, uh, you, excuse me, you will be restless, a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today, you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain, in his response to perceived rejection, took it out on his brother, killed him. And God, in his rightful way, could have killed Cain as well. Really, probably should have happened. And and yet, he doesn't. He shows Cain mercy by allowing him to live, and then not only allowing him to live, marking him and protecting him from being killed by someone else. Man, so many times in our anger and our resentment and our feelings of rejection, we miss God's mercy and his protection in our life. Even when we do what is wrong, God still loves us and is looking after us. Here's what we miss, and here's what Cain missed. He missed God's mercy because he missed these things. He missed that God had already accepted him. He missed The warning that God gave him. Why are you so angry? Why are you downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? He he missed his ability to rectify it. God tried to give him a new perspective and saying, hey, like it's going to be okay. Just do do what's right. You're going to be okay. And then he warns him that if you don't, that the enemy is crouching ready to, to, to take you. But Cain couldn't get over his feelings of rejection. And he took it out on his brother, and he ruined lives, families, generations. Interesting that as we read through Hebrews, again, the faith chapter, we don't hear a thing about Cain. I had to go all the way back to the story to bring up the rejection that was dealt with in this moment. All we hear about in Hebrews 11 is about who? About Abel. Maybe you can relate to this. 
I think many of us can. I think many of us can grab hold and understand a piece of this. We've seen it played out in our own lives. And so, so the thing that you might be asking is, okay, well, well where's the hope in this? Uh, because I've already been rejected. I, I've already felt the pain. I've already maybe even lashed out in the wrong ways. Like, where is the hope in this? And it's the same hope that I'll give you that God gave Cain because he had already given him these things and he was asking him to do it differently than he did. And I'm just going to give you the same thing. I'm going to show you the hope for how you can respond even if you are rejected but to hopefully give you some eyes to see that sometimes, especially in the eyes of God, it may not be rejection. It may just be a, hold on, son, I got something better for you. You see, we can connect to God because his son Jesus lived this exact same experience. He, but he gives you hope, and here's where the hope lies, because Christ Jesus came, and, and we see this in Romans 5.8. It says this, but God demonstrated his love for his own love for us in this. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you hear that? Before you were accepted. Before you were forgiven, before you had figured it out and gotten on the right track and gotten on the right path and seen God for who he is and given your life to him, while you were yet still doing whatever you wanted to do in your own way, in your own time, even yet, while still that was happening, Christ died for you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he wanted to show you that he, is, he accepts you and he wants to be in relationship with you. He also understands rejection. I'm going to run through these really quickly. But this is what Christ, our, our Savior, experienced. This is in Mark 12. Have you not even read the scripture? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This is speaking of Jesus. The, the, the Pharisees and the leaders of the day rejected Jesus as Messiah. Matthew 8 and verse thir uh, and 34. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. Yo, you felt rejected? Imagine walking up into the town and be like, nah, homie, we don't want you here. You got to get. Not just like one person, the whole town. Man. Mark 6 and 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and, uh, and Hoses, and Joseph, that's misspelled in my Bible here, and Judas and Simon, and not his sisters here with us, are they, and they took offense at him? We were talking about offense at Jesus. Isn't that the carpenter guy? He's not the son of God. And then finally, John 1 and 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Anybody even been rejected by your own family? Your own people? This is what Christ Jesus encountered and dealt with. He was rejected, and yet, while we were still sinners, he died for us. Even while we were still doing whatever we wanted to do, he paid the price for us. Because he loves you. Because you missed it. You felt rejected when he's trying to say, you've already been accepted. He accepts you. He just simply asks that you don't reject him. And so many times when we're hurt, that's what we do. We take our, we take our hurt and our anger and our pain out on God. And it's misplaced. Man, I wish I had a magic potion to take away the hurt and the pain that you felt from rejection. I wish I had that. I wish I had it for myself, man. It, it hurts. To think about things that people have said to you, to think about things that have been done to you, it's painful. I wish I could take that away. But the hope is not that the rejection that you've had will go away. The hope is in that now we understand how to deal with rejection as we move forward, right? Because Jesus... We have the pathway. We have the pathway. I, I think about this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, 
we took my kids to uh, Disney on Ice. Anybody else take your kids to Disney on Ice and blow all kinds of money on crap? They'll never, blow. yeah, it's great. So, um, I, so I take my kids to Disney on Ice and my mother goes and she spoils my kids. She just buys them all kinds of junk and, and they love it. And, uh, and so she buys them all this stuff and uh, one's like a lightsaber, one's a $40 stuffy that, you know, has been dragged around the yard already, things like that. And, and so not one minute after she had spent like 120 bucks on this stuff, you know what they do? Hey, can we get some popcorn? Can we get some M&Ms? Can we get a Sprite? Like, they, they're just like never satisfied. Ne- never satisfied. And, and so I had a conversation with them because we were then about to go to the beach and I had a conversation with them about being okay with what you've been given, being happy with what you've had and, and accepting what you've gotten and not feeling like you've missed out because you didn't get anything more than what you've already been given. And I thought it was a really good parenting moment. I thought, man, they're going to get this. They're like six and four. They got it, right? Wrong. <laughs> so this past week, again, I mentioned to you that uh, we were away at the beach. And, um, and so, man, here we go. We have, this happens so many times. We, per, we put a meal on the table and it's stuff that they normally eat. And of course, at this time, they don't want it. And then they go and, and they don't want that and they want a snack. And then after a snack, they want an ice cream. And then after the ice cream, they want a snack number two and, and second breakfast and all this other stuff, right? They want all these different things. And the reality is, is that they're never satisfied because they always keep coming and saying, I didn't want that. I want this. I, I don't want that. I want this. And they're just never satisfied. Now, they're kids. And one day I pray that they will come to know Jesus and that Jesus will save them and that Jesus will give them a new heart and the Spirit of God would move in them and and that they would have then a growing understanding of their own desires versus God's desires. But aside from sweet baby Claire and maybe a couple of other babies in the room, everyone else under the sound of my voice is old enough to understand that you have desires You have things that you want, but there are things that God wants. And the problem is, is that this goes all the way back to the fall of Eve and Adam. If you go back and read it, it says that the fruit was desirable. And that's what led Eve to pluck it and to eat and to give it to her husband and the fall of man happened. What desire did Cain have here that led him to such a place when he didn't get what he wanted, that he was so angry that it led him to being angry, downcast, killing his brother, and changing the course of history because this was the first family. And so today, I will just remind you of the wisdom that God gave Cain right there in that moment. And he says, if you do what is right, Will you not be accepted? Pause. Christ has already accepted you. And what he's saying is, is as you walk this journey, the way you have and keep his favor is you just keep walking and doing what he asks you to do. He asks for you to have desires for him and his ways even when it doesn't quite line up with what you want and then the second part just drives it home he says but if you do not do what is right sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you but you must rule over it This is the hope that I can't give you, but Christ Jesus can. It's his word that the desires that you think, your anger, your resentment, your frustration, your your pain, those things that you desire that you need to rectify and get over and, and punish someone for, those are desires that Christ Jesus says, you actually have the power to rule over that. 
You have the power and the ability to move on. If you would just do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You cannot necessarily control all of the things that happen to you. You can't. The pains that you felt with aren't just going to magically go away. They're not. But how you respond is God's way of telling you how hope can be found. Your response matters. So I'll just simply ask you this. What's your response? Because we didn't read anything about Cain in Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. We read about Abel. What did the Bible tell us about Abel? The Bible told us that, that, that Abel brought a first fruit offering to God. See, here's the thing. We had our first reading. We thought, oh man, Cain was shafted. Here's the reality. Our God is a, a God of clarity. It's not written in scripture, but no doubt these two boys, God had given them an explanation of what he expected of them. And Abel did what was right, Cain did not. See, God had already accepted Cain. He wasn't rejecting him in this moment. Cain was rejecting God by not doing what he had asked. And then God in his grace and mercy comes back to him and says, yeah, yeah, but it's okay. Don't be angry because I got a way, man. You're going to be fine or you're going to be accepted. Just do what's right. You're going to be fine. Abel has accounted to him righteousness, the Bible says. He has faith, the Bible says, that we read about. And we'll read later in Hebrews 11 that he's part of the great cloud of witnesses that preach to faith. And then the Bible even says that Abel preaches faith, yet he is dead. Why? Because he did what was right. Because he did what was right. Today, I simply ask you this, this question. How you respond to the things that have happened to you, God gives you a chance today to respond and to do what is right. What does that mean? How do I know what is right? Well, first of all, this is something we've been talking about all year, but we want to encourage you to have an everyday relationship with Jesus. When you do that, you will know and spend time in God's word, and when you know and spend time in God's word, you will know and go God's way. And then eventually, as you know and understand and go God's way, you will move from just being a believer to being a disciple, a disciplined follower of Jesus. So how do I know what to do? I need to spend time in his word. The Holy Spirit will convict me when I spend time doing what is wrong. It'll be made clear to me when I'm doing wrong. The question is, will I stop doing it and do what is right? I want to ask you, would you change your perspective today? The way that you see things. The way that we worry about ourselves so much that we miss God's other-centered gospel. He tells us that the way to life is to give ours up. The way to lead is to serve. The way to, to be first is to be last. It is a complete counter-cultural way of understanding the way that we live And then I'll just remind you that what you may have received as rejection from God may just be his graciousness, his kindness, and his mercy saying, not right now, son. Not right now, daughter. I got better for you. I got better for you. Hebrews is all about the faith chapter and the faith chapter speaks to faith faith is about trusting God even when you can't see it faith is about trusting God even when you don't understand it and so here's the invitation today the response that you have in rejection has everything to do with faith do you actually trust God that he's good that he has good plans, that he has better for you, that things are going to work out for the good of those that love him? Do you actually trust and believe those things? Or is it just like really nice rhetorical things that we like to say, but we don't really believe? Faith 
is the evidence of things that we hope for. The substance of things not yet seen. See, we, we, what we're called to is to trust. Faith, trust, same thing here. So I ask you today to look back over those times that you felt rejected. No doubt you felt it. Not dismantling it, not discrediting it at all. It's a real and understandable emotion when you've been rejected and you feel that way by other people. How did you respond? Now I want you to take a moment and consider maybe those times where you felt rejected by God. I want to ask you, how did you respond? If you're able, would you stand to your feet? I want to give you an opportunity, like we do every week, to respond to what God wants to do in your heart. Maybe it's just you need to do some business with God. You need to talk about maybe the hurts and the the pains that you felt, the the rejections that you felt from other people. Maybe you just need to process that and work through some forgiveness. Man, I know exactly what that feels like. I was a 15-year-old boy, and my dad walked out the family, uh, walked away from our family to go start another one. Man, I know what rejection feels like. I just wonder if you've processed those feelings of rejection. See, it's one thing to feel them. It's another thing to actually process it. The the second thing I'll ask you to consider is this, especially for those, because rejection is one thing, but the heavy burden of feeling like you've been rejected by God, that is a whole nother level. And I know for a fact that there are some of you in the room that are carrying that today. You feel like God has abandoned you, left you behind. You feel like God has been against you. I want to just ask you for a few moments to consider a different, an alternative response and a different way of looking at maybe that feeling of rejected. Is it possible that he actually has better for you? Is it possible that he's been trying to protect you from things or yourself? Is it possible that he's just waiting for you to wait on him to actually trust him? Is it possible that he actually does have good plans for you, but you can't see them because you're too angry? You can't hear about them because you won't talk to him. You can't receive it because you have shut him out. And so over the next few moments, we're going to sing a song, and we've sang it a few times recently, but it's called Good Plans. And for some of you today, I think you can sing it, and it's declarative, and you're like, yeah, God has good plans for me, and you know it right here, which is great. Amen. Like, sing, worship. But man, I know what it feels like to be rejected. And maybe today as you hear this, this just needs to be a reminder from the Lord speaking life over you, speaking hope over you, that he has not left you. He has not forsaken you. He does love you. He has accepted you. And he wants you to do what is right and you'll continue to be accepted. He wants to protect you from sin and the enemy. God does have good plans for you. And so maybe it's just a posture of receiving, God. Spirit, speak to me. Give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. And for others, maybe you just need to take a seat and you just need to talk to God. Maybe the altar will be open. You're welcome to come and pray. I'll be standing right over here in this corner. If you need someone to pray over you, I'd love to do that. So I'll invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want to pray over you and then we're going to sing. God, we love you. And Father, man, sometimes it's hard. It's so hard to see things your way. When we are so filled with our own desires and our own ways, God, it's difficult to see your hand at work when we only see our hands not having what we want in them. God, the pain of rejection can be debilitating. And so, God, I come to you right now and I pray to you on behalf of your sons and daughters, God, that you would bring forgiveness today that you would show mercy today, God, that you would um, give us 
God, give us understanding from your ways. God, that you would give us vision to see what you have for us. God, that you would help us forgive those who we've held grudges and animosity against. God, that you would help forgive us and help us forgive ourselves for the way we've responded when we've been hurt. God, for those that have been rejected by people, I pray that you would do a reviving work in their heart today, that you would draw them to yourself. God, for those that have felt rejected by you, I pray that right now, over these next few moments, that you, your spirit would speak to them, that they would have no doubt that your presence is here and that you love them and that you are for them. God, I pray that you would reassure them, speak to their heart in these moments. God, help us know what is right to do. Give us the courage and the strength to do it. God, forgive us where we fail. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for taking the time to enjoy this message from Home Church. We hope that God used today's message to encourage you and to challenge you as you heard the teaching of his word. Listen, if there's anything in today's message that spoke to you, or if you asked Jesus into your life today, let us know. We would love to celebrate with you. Simply send us an email at hello at myhomechurch.cc and let us know that you made that decision today. Also, if today's message uh, impacted your life, uh, you can take a step forward and a step into supporting the ministry of Home Church by giving online right now at myhomechurch.cc. Again, thank you for watching today's message. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you get all of the fresh content from Home Church.